that tension between philosophy and poetry. Finally, we should ask ourselves the question in reading this dialogue, is philosophy good or salutary for the city or for political life? Or is there something subversive about philosophy that calls into question many of the beliefs that are essential for political life? For example, beliefs about the gods. I mean, Socrates, he brings that up early on in the Apology. Is it possible to be a good philosopher, a person devoted to questioning, to thinking, to contemplation, and at the same time to be a good citizen of a country or of a city? Are those two really compatible? Or does what philosophy require of a person compel that person to act against the best interest of the city? or the state. Okay, so I don't know if Socrates answers those questions completely, but they're real good questions to think about as we read and study the Apology of Socrates. Okay, I skipped over the list of questions there because I just addressed them in the previous slide. So let's look at the two, act, the two sets of accusations that are raised against Socrates. Now, it's interesting that Socrates is ultimately convicted of corrupting the youth of Athens and not worshiping or believing in the gods of the city. And let's refer to those as the new accusations brought against Socrates by Anatus and Melitus. However, somewhat surprisingly and mysteriously, I would argue, Socrates first brings up a set of older accusations brought against him by the Greek a poet Aristophanes. Okay, so if you read this dialogue closely, you might have come across the name Aristophanes. And Aristophanes was a Greek poet, a Greek a comic poet, who is best known for a work of his called The Clouds. And in The Clouds, Aristophanes, as a comic poet, spends most of his time making fun of Socrates. For example, he presents Socrates as an out-of-touch natural scientist, someone who spends his time in the clouds, or someone who is really out-of-touch with the world that's going on around him. Okay, and the work is meant to be a comic work. It's meant to be funny. So he'll say things that Socrates te teaches incest, for example, that he teaches children um, not to believe in the gods, that he <clears throat> confuses children into turning against their parents and using physical force against their parents. I mean, we might think of those as serious charges, and they are, but they're set forth in a context that is, is pretty funny. And, I mean, if you ever read that work, I think you'll be impressed by the comic, the comic uh, content that it really brings forth. So Socrates here, in the Apology, to turn back to the Apology, brings up these older accusations. Now, the question we have to ask ourselves is, why would he do that? I mean, if he's on trial for not believing in the gods of the city and for corrupting the youth, why would he bring up some older charges that are brought against him? I mean, that would be like somebody today who's maybe on trial for tax evasion bringing up a former kidnapping accusation, for example, just to throw something out there. I mean, why would, why would somebody do that? It's almost like he's digging himself into a, a, a bigger hole, okay? But for whatever reason, and we want to think about that, Socrates does bring up these older accusations, 
first made against him by Aristophanes. And the older accusations consist of two, two things. That Socrates spends his time investigating the heavens and the things beneath the earth, and that Socrates makes the worst argument the stronger. Okay, so he states those very quickly into the dialogue, um, actually on the first page. <clears throat> Let's look a little closer here at these older accusations. Number one, we'll take investigating things in the heavens and under the earth. The meaning of the charge is that the philosopher studies nature and gives a true account of celestial things differing from that given by religious myths. In thinking about this, we should wonder about the domain represented by the heavens and the things under the earth. And if we think about it, it will become clear that that is really the domain of the gods. Right? The gods populate the heavens. Hades would represent what's under the earth. It's the religious sphere that this charge is really meant to, to bring up. And Socrates... Um, as Aristophanes points out in his clouds, teaches a mechanical explanation for Zeus's thunderbolt. So instead of thinking of a thunderbolt as a divine judgment leveled by Zeus himself, Socrates, it's said by Aristophanes, gives a mechanical or a natural explanation of this. So I think the meaning of the charge is clear that somehow Socrates is meddling in the affairs of the gods, that he's trying to undermine religious belief in some way. And that way would be by trying to give a natural explanation for these events. Number two. It was said by Aristophanes that Socrates makes the weaker argument the stronger and teaches this art to others. And what Aristophanes is getting at here in this charge is that Socrates has a way of distorting truth. That Socrates can take something that's true and manipulate it or to distort it or twist it in such a way that the person no longer knows that it's true. In fact, he's twisted it in such a way that it, it appears to be false. So this would not be a good, uh, a good reputation to have, that Socrates um, is really about subverting truth that he's about taking truth and turning it into a lie or making it appear to be something false. Okay, now notice here at the top of the screen I have some numbers up there. And these are Stephanus numbers. And they function the same way that a chapter and verse functions in the Bible. So if you're reading the Bible and you want to look up John uh, 3.16, for example, probably the most famous biblical verse, it doesn't matter what translation uh, or what edition you're looking at, you know that if you go to John 3.16, you're going to come across that famous passage, right, that God so loved the world. Well, these numbers here in Plato's works function in the same way. So no matter what translation or edition you're reading of the Apology of Socrates, if you go to 18c, you'll come across the older accusations brought against Socrates. So anytime I refer to these numbers, that's what I'm referring to. It's almost like chapter and verse... Um, for the Bible. Okay, <clears throat> so Socrates actually repeats the older accusations brought against him three different times. He first states the charges in 18c, 
which is what we have on the screen. He repeats the charges again 